Good morning, everybody. This is Carl, and I see lots of people checking in. I love the, the whole, uh, oh, welcome from Wyoming and Southern California and Oklahoma City, so forth. Um, we are going to get started here. I'm always interested in seeing how many people show up for these things, and um, we have over 140 people registered, so uh, welcome, everybody. We almost have 50 online. We'll be there in just a second, and I just encourage you to go ahead and use the chat. I'm not going to pay attention to it because it's not my deal, but uh, Kara will. All right, so let's get started. Welcome to my 13th annual State of the Nation address for SMBIT. And um, I'm hoping that we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, jot those down uh, and so forth. I'm gonna take questions in the Q&A panel. So if you wanna queue those up as we go along, you're welcome to do so. For those of you who are new here, uh, my name is Carl Palachuk and I have written Many books. My favorite recent book is the Small Biz Quick Start Workbook, which <laughs> is not really IT centric. But if you know anybody who's starting a business, this is literally the complete checklist of everything you need to think about before you actually pull the trigger and, and uh, go uh, get a business license. And then a second list of everything you need to do uh, in order to actually go from not being self-employed to being self-employed. Uh, and then a checklist of all the things you need to do the first year. So I think it's a really great resource and I encourage you to uh, buy a copy for everyone you know and, uh, and tell everybody to uh, go look for that. So <clears throat> today we're gonna talk about kind of this, what I consider the state of the nation for SMB IT. Uh, if you have feedback for me, please go to uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that. Um, just a little history. So I started uh, with computers back in the 1980s and bought my first VIC-20 in 1982 and have enjoyed working with computers ever since then and um, didn't do it commercially until the 90s. But I worked for, I ran the internal tech support for, I, um, for HP's Roseville plant, uh, supporting a, a staff that managed about 5,000 desktops with about 7,000 computers and laptops. Uh, I also managed the backups for the entire Roseville plant and the Unix help desk. And then I moved to a company that did online services. And I was there in 1994 when the internet was opened up to commercial use. And so I was heavily involved in technology in the decade before that, and obviously in <laughs> all of the decades since then. Um, I went on my own and started my own consulting company in 1995. Uh, HP was my first big client. Um, gradually moved to serving multiple clients at one time. And that's when I realized I was doing business a little differently than other people. And started doing regular monthly maintenance because when you have big iron, there cannot be a failed backup. There cannot be um, a system go down. When people are paying you for online services, uh, things can't be fragile. And so I developed a system of regular monthly maintenance. And once I figured that out, I figured out how to flat fee it and um, basically help develop what is commonly known today as managed services. So uh, decided to write some books on that and now that's my life. So just a few notes for people. Um, <laughs> every year we have somebody say, I can't hear, I can't hear. And it turns out you gotta turn your speakers up. Uh, it's just, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, please use the questions panel, not the chat for questions to me. And I will try to answer everything uh, as we go along. This is being recorded, so that's always the first question, the second question that comes up. Um, and if you can, I appreciate it. if you want to Twitter or tweet about this or you post on anything on Facebook, use the hashtag SBT, which is Small Biz Thoughts. And uh, with that, here we go. The recording will be posted at mspwebinar.com. And just a side note, 
if you go there, one of the things you're going to find is that I've got various webinars from over the years, including last year's um, State of the Nation address. So you can side check me when I say I claim this, you can go find where that is. Um, I recently put up a cybersecurity training, and this is a model training that is totally free. All you have to do is just download it. I give you an, a complete PowerPoint slide deck and a recording of me presenting this training to uh, a client live. One of my clients that's been with me since 1999 um, has, you know, they came to me and said, we need you to train our, our people, uh, something that I do about every three years for them. And so I recorded it because we did it on Zoom instead of, you know, in person in their office. And this is the actual training as I delivered it to them. And I only give that to you as a sample of what you should be doing for your clients. So download that PowerPoint slide deck, take out my logos and branding, uh, put in your graphics and you know, update it with examples from the next cybersecurity incident, which is gonna happen any minute. <laughs> There's a new one every week of some size, um, but that's a resource that you should take advantage of. And it's absolutely free, just go get it. And uh, obviously, you know, that's a lead gen thing for me as well, but it's the kind of thing I like to do. These are some of my brands, and I'm not going to have Kara post all of these in the uh, chat, but um, we do lots of things here. All of the activities in my company are around helping IT service providers to be as successful as possible. It is literally the goal of my life and my company at this point, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm an old man. So, <laughs> you know, you got to figure out what's your last thing you want to do. Quick note, a week from today is Killing It Live. So if you haven't listened to the Killing It podcast, it's pretty fun. Uh, Dave Sobel, Ryan Morris, and I get together and we pick three topics and we go into uh, only 10 minutes worth of depth, but a little bit of depth in it, a little bit of analysis. Um, and then uh, we're going to do a Killing It Live podcast, and that's sponsored by Cisco and what we're going to do there is give you some behind the scenes uh, looks, uh, allow you to chat with us. And then we're going to add a fourth segment that is only for people who are uh, watching it live. So there you go. Check that out at killingitlive.com. So today I have just a few announcements and then uh, what I normally do, some thoughts on 2021, some thoughts on 2022, and then a theme that sort of wraps it together. And, you know, if you, we're here for the very first slide. My question is, what's changed and what are you going to do about it? So I want to I look at that question of what's changed. First, this is a very sad summary for me of <laughs> 2021. I recently saw a thing on Facebook where I looked back at 2019 and uh, I had gone to 21 cities and the year before I'd gone to 24 and the year before I'd gone to 30 some and uh, now it's like, oh, I went, I went to two cities, <laughs> uh, you know. So it's been a slow year in the in the world of live events, but that's allowed me to do some major things uh, in our community and in what we do. I do a lot of blogging and a lot of podcasts, and uh, actually a fair number of uh, YouTube videos as well. Uh, and I've, I just enjoy producing this stuff. And, you know, if there's a topic that you think that I should cover, uh, please send me a note and I would appreciate that. So one of the things that we do is I run a community called the Small Biz Thoughts Technology Community. And we've had a huge growth this year and we do a lot of members only content. And so if you haven't checked that out yet, now is a great time to do that. Uh, we just added the ability for every single member of that at any level to uh, attend all of our five week trainings at no charge. So uh, check it out. <clears throat> all right, that's, that's the end of the commercial. So I was a, a while back, I was a member of the Taylor Business Group. Uh, I was in a peer group there. And the peer group leader was Mr. Josh Peterson, who's currently with Bering McKinley. And Josh was talking about the hiring process. And he said, there's a one question 
that's very powerful that you have to answer. And this, it's funny, this may be a minor thing for Josh, but for me, it really stood out and it was like a neon sign. And the question is when you are in a, a, a second or a third or sometimes a fourth interview of a job candidate, always ask the question, what's changed since I saw you last? And the reason is, and this is super clear today in the, in the middle of the great resignation, that uh, you know, people ghost you. Right? People were like, uh, you know, they 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 even accept a job and then don't show up for the first day. Um, and the way to avoid that is to ask them very clearly, "What's changed since I saw you last?" It's not a normal interview question, but it I want I don't want to say it forces them. It allows them to say things like, "Oh well, you know, my spouse just got a really great job and we're going to move." or I, I got an offer from another company, right? A follow-up question is, if I offered you this job, is there any reason that you would not be able to take it or that you would not take it? And you know, again, in the great resignation, uh, I've just uh, done my third round of trying to get good resumes. And for whatever reason, suddenly with the third ad, uh, I've got good resumes for a position I'm hiring for. But it takes a lot of work. And, and so I took that question and I adopted it in many areas of my life and businesses. And when, when I'm in a mastermind group, I always want the mastermind group to have the very first thing on the agenda is to go around and ask people, what's changed since I saw you last? And again, it's super powerful. It's an open-ended question. And it allows people to look and say, well, you know, I got this going on in my personal life, or um, <clears throat> I have this challenge, or everybody in the family is sick, <laughs> right? Or, you know, whatever. I, I had a super great win. I'm talking to a, a vendor and, and I have so much uh, good news that I, I'm going to be distracted, right? It allows people to give you a broader picture of what's going on for them. And so today I want to talk about what's changed in our industry um, and not, not just in the last, whatever, year and a half, but the last five years, the last 10 years, because we are in a different environment than we have ever been. And uh, it really helps to understand that in order to know how we move forward. So let me do kind of in the, one of my normal things. I, I wanna look at the economy. And for me, uh, I've decided now to stop stop paying attention to the Dow because I think the NASDAQ <laughs> actually represents your economy better than uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Averages. So <clears throat> the Dow went up almost 20% in one year or almost, yeah, 20%. And that's kind of huge, you know, uh, it had a, uh, a big dip in March um, and now, you know, we got to ask the question and I've been asking this, I think this is my third or fourth year to ask, are we due for a correction? Right. Um, but fundamentally, even though inflation just is announced as being up 7%, we're going to see some inflation, but fundamentals are good. That as soon as people stop coughing and get back to work, and as soon as the, the, now 5 million people who uh, reported on, that they were unemployed last week, uh, once they get back to work, um, it is going to be pretty straightforward that we're going up. Now, last year, you know, there was this big dip in March and then it corrected. And, and my projection was that we were going to continue that line. This is literally from last year's slide deck. And I was only wrong a little bit because not only did it go up, but you see the arrow there? That's the point at which the chart on the left ends. And it went up at a steeper level than it had been. So that six year chart shows the, the NASDAQ growing uh, much more steeply. And that's important because it means that even if we get some inflation um, if, if that curve went back down to the spectacular growth <laughs> that it already had, we'd be okay. Um, so I really believe that in 2022, um, we're going to see a lot of improvement. Uh, the chip shortage that we're all uh, experiencing is going to ease up a little bit. 
And that means that, for example, cars, which are a lar large part of that inflation picture, cars are go going to become a little more affordable. The supply chain issues are going to uh, get a little bit better. Uh, you know, the ports no longer have the huge backlogs they have. And so generally, little by little, um, things are going to straighten out. And, you know, uh, I don't want to talk about politics, but, you know, you can't put trillions of dollars into the economy and not see some inflation. So um, for a long time, I've always said uh, we need a little inflation because this thing of going to the bank and, and getting zero percent on your deposits, uh, you know, that's that's not good either. So um, a little bit of inflation is good. What we're seeing now, and this may be reflected in the job market, is that you know there are some areas where people just will not work uh, unless they get a certain amount of money. And I think that this whole pandemic experience has made that very clear. We talk about that a lot on the uh, Killing It podcast and kind of that human side of, of the market. So I want to talk about some predictions and uh, try to uh, not be political about any of this. So in 2021, um, I said that the economy would keep going uh, and not skip a beat. And that was, of course, correct. Um, I also said that work from home would uh, permanently notch up. Um, and, you know, that's correct. But it also wasn't a difficult one to figure out. Um, although it, uh, it might have been a little more difficult in January than it was in June. Um, and I said that cyber attacks are going to focus on you and your clients. And, and, and by that, I mean, if you support people in finance, uh, attorneys, you know, your clients have um, something very equivalent to the, like the attacks that we've seen in our own industry. They all have some big database with all of their clients' data on it. I recently hired a new uh, uh, person to do my taxes. And one of my first questions is, where does this data live? I want to know it. And at first, she wasn't sure. And so I probed a little because I'm like, is there a server in your office? And is my name on that server? <laughs> right? Is, is my client data on your server? Uh, and uh, so it took a little while, but you know, I'm at the point where I want it in the cloud. I, I don't want it in a, a closet uh, behind her desk, right? Uh, and so we're going to see these attacks, and this is happening. Um, it's just not as huge as it's going to be. So I would predict for 2022 that we're going to see more of these attacks, and they're going to be to all of the line of business applications out there. Um, <clears throat> And I also said that the era of regulation and financial uh, threats uh, is going to affect us. And this is certainly true. Insurance rates uh, are through the roof. There's lots of discussion about that on the forums. And we're seeing these regulations. You know, I don't know if it's every state yet, but almost every state has proposed legislation. And um, it's, it's going to happen one way or another. And sort of related to that, I had mentioned because of information from Mike Semmel of Semmel Consulting, uh, and I always give a tip of the hat to Mike on this. I think he's the industry leader on this information. He talked about NIST and CMMC becoming the industry standards, and they have really pushed forward uh, to make that happen. And a, a lot of their stuff is geared towards larger organizations, um, but that makes sense because that's where the dollars are the biggest. Um, so what's changed? When you look back and it, it's just, you know, on say five years, 10 years, 15 years, this industry has been morphing at lightning speed. Uh, for those of you who have been in this industry only five years, you have seen dramatic changes in uh, the way that we uh, are expected to be a little more professional. Uh, if you've been in here 10 years, you have seen the adoption of tools across the board for many, many things. Um, and in some sense, kind of giving up some of the hands-on control that we had 15 years ago. All along the way, there have been good actors. And by, by good actors, I mean people who are honest and forthright, who have integrity, who uh, quote a job and stick with the quote, who give their clients their documentation and the keys to their, their own kingdom, which they've paid for. Uh, and there are bad actors. There are people who say, oh, 
you know, I, I'll support your desktop for $40 a desktop. Everybody knows that's not possible. It is a complete lie to make that presentation to people. Um, there are people who make promises and then don't fulfill them. There are people who sell backup systems and never check whether or not they're good. And I had said uh, a couple of years ago that the age of the amateur was over. And what I meant by that was that you can't be uneducated and be in this uh, business anymore. You can't figure shit out uh, uh, for five or 10 years and get by. And it, we're now at the point where the stakes are so high. You and your clients are literally under attack from foreign powers, from organizations backed by uh, the governments of North Korea and China and the Soviet Union, or Russia, I guess it is today. <laughs> but you know, you are under attack and you have to take that very seriously. And the people who wave their hand and say, I don't have to worry about that. Well, you need to walk away from those people and you need to not be those people. Um, we're also more professional in the sense that people understand you have to have a contract. And I don't think a day goes by when I don't see somebody post something on Reddit asking, hey, has anybody got a contract I can download? And I'm like, oh my God, don't sign some random piece of paper that you found on the internet. <laughs> that is literally, I, I cannot imagine being more um, amateurish in your business than to think that you're going to find some random piece of paper on the internet and you can build a multi-million dollar business on it. And it's just not going to happen. You need to know why each paragraph in that um, contract exists. And I think you should start with a good contract from a reputable source, take it to your attorney um, and move in that direction. Um, and you know, five years ago, I was still hearing people say, my clients trust me, oh, a handshake is good enough. I don't need to sign a contract. That's just absurd. First of all, the contract is not about what you sell. It's about the relationship with the client. You can staple managed services or cloud services or Microsoft licensing to the back of it, but the contract is about the relationship. And in an era where people are being sued for millions of dollars because they are being accused of not appropriately taking care of their clients, when we have the Federal Trade Commission going after you because your employees are selling data on the side, when we have uh, NISA or CISA coming out and telling your clients to be wary of MSPs, you need to take this very seriously. And so you can no longer be uneducated and be in this business. And I know if you're on this call, <laughs> that's not a problem, but you need to understand we've always had these bad actors who have affected how we are perceived by our clients. And that problem is going to get worse. So be aware that that's the environment and that we need to get back to another thing that's changed, which is education. For too much of the last 10 years, people have figured out, oh, I can go on Google and fake it until I make it. And you know, I still see articles that irritate me that say, hey, you want an easy job you can get into that doesn't take any skill whatsoever? Go be a computer consultant. That just pisses me off, right? Because nobody on this call is, is the kind of person who just Googles everything. Um, and if you are, I hope this is your last day of doing that. You need to know the technology. You need to master the technology that you sell. And we're going to get back to the fact that you can't master every technology. And so what do you do about that? Because that's something that has changed as well. The evolution of our space was that we took people who had no computers and sold them computers. Then we sold them networks. Then we sold them a central server to make all of that work together safely and securely. Then we started moving things to the cloud and got rid of most or all of those servers. And so there's this constant evolution. And the next piece of it is that you have to figure out how to support stuff when you cannot understand and master all the knowledge in the universe.
but you are still going to be the primary contact for all of this technology. Um, that is the great challenge we have ahead of us. So in the last year, uh, many people were introduced to CISA for the first time um, and great, great website, the uh, security and infrastructure security, uh, cybersecurity infrastructure and security agency. Um, that's as bad as National Society for IT Service Providers. Anyway, um, they've put out some great guidance and they have also put out um, some warnings. They've literally got a document about advising your clients what to be careful about when they hire a managed service provider. Now that is luckily for us geared towards larger technology organizations and in, in some ways, uh, larger government-based IT organizations. Uh, Amy Babinchak has given a draft and I owe her some comments on a draft of a smaller business version of that same document. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard, but one way or another, the government is going to be, is, is in and will continue to be in the business of telling you how to run your business, telling your clients how to run your business. Now, last year, one of the things I said is that there's a massive opportunity in doing audits. I think that continues to be true. Um, and so I encourage you to look into you know, CMMC and CISA and find out what's going on and make sure that you are completely educated on where this indus industry is going and ignoring it and saying, oh, no, 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 uh, we don't want regulation. will have absolutely zero effect on any of this. <laughs> the regulation is coming. Your only choice is will you participate in how it, what it looks like or will you not? So what we didn't see coming was the great resignation you know, millions of people who uh, uh, just decided not to show up for work one day. And this is a weird thing, certainly unique in my lifetime. It may have happened before, but I'm unaware of it. And, you know, the, the, this whole thing uh, is based in part on, you know, people realizing, opening their eyes in the middle of a pandemic and saying the world could be different than it used to be. You know, in the hospitality industry, uh, this is huge that, you know, you think about somebody who comes in and they enjoy serving, whether it's a restaurant or a bar or whatever, they want to be in that customer service role. They want to be uh, doing what they do. But at least in the United States, they tend to get somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six dollars an hour as a base pay plus tips. Well, when all the people disappear or are using DoorDash, the tips disappear. So now instead of getting a real minimum wage, they're getting $5 an hour and you know an extra dollar a day. Right? So of course they're gonna quit their job. Why would they continue to even show up? And so that's where I think it's the worst. Um, and you know, as with many other things, this is, this is lopsided. There are people who don't have any choice but to keep doing those jobs. Um, which is why I, I hope uh, I would encourage you all to over tip like crazy um, because a lot of these folks, they, they are not making the money that they deserve. Um, and so we're seeing McDonald's raise their rates to $15 an hour. We're seeing lots of businesses increase their rates. So part of that inflation is the response to this. And I think this will mellow out. I think there'll be a point where the wages are high enough that people decide that they are gonna leave their houses. Clearly the pandemic is a piece of this that people have to feel safe that they can leave their houses. Um, the interesting thing is that there's a, there's, it's, I wouldn't know, say it's massive, but there is a significant difference between the number of men and the number of women uh, who are resigning. And you know, part of this is related to the fact that the women already have lower uh, wages on average. And so um, they are also a significant number of the people who are starting new jobs. I don't think these people are disappearing from the face of the earth. You don't, you don't quit a $5 an hour job and, and move to uh, you know, Buenos Aires. Um, so they're, they're doing other things and, and they're waiting for their opportunity to get back in. A lot of them are doing side hustles. All of this affects you, right? All of this affects the, the environment in which your clients are trying to manage their businesses, grow their businesses, get their head around what's going on. 
I always encourage people, especially when the economy is bumpy and, and you're nervous about what's going on, look for people who are starting new adventures and are taking a chance in the middle of difficult times because some of them are going to skyrocket. And a lot of people are investing so that when things straighten out and everybody's you know, back to some kind of normal, that they have a step up on their competition. Um, find those, find those people and make them your clients and uh, you'll be able to ride that way for quite a while. And of course, that's a, that's a rare occurrence, but you know, those people are out there. Another big thing that happened in 2021 is uh, the National Society of IT Service Providers. And this started with um, some blog posts and webinars and a founding document. And if you haven't read it, uh, it's not very long. I can't remember, 15 pages or something. Transforming an industry into a profession, which is the nine pillars of an IT profession. This is a, basically a document where I talk about the things that we need to do, in my opinion, uh, in order to move forward. And part of this is to build our industry into something that is more formalized and has a structure that allows newbies to be successful and builds a path for them to move up to um, doing well. You know, I, I always tell people it's just, it's one of the great shames in this industry is that people work for 20 or 30 years and they have no money in the bank. And literally me creating the uh, Small Biz Thoughts Technology Community was all about wanting to put an end to going to a conference and meeting somebody who is in their 50s and 60s with no money in the bank because they hadn't done it a certain way or they hadn't focused enough on squirreling away some money. And so they're putting their business on credit cards. They're not getting paid in advance. And every month they get a little deeper in debt. And so what happens is at the end of, of their career, they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. There's absolutely no reason for that to be the norm. And I think it's less of a norm than it was 10 years ago. So what's changed? Part of becoming professional is that people have actually you know, paid themselves a salary, actually squirreled away a little extra money, actually committed to building a future for themselves. And I'll tell you a huge thing that's happened in the last five years, and maybe a little bit longer, is that people have a legit exit strategy. People say, I'm gonna to get to this point, I'm gonna draw a line, and I'm gonna figure out how to sell my business. And I may get a little more or a little less than I want, but I'm going to exit with money in my pocket. Um, and that is a huge thing. So many people, literally 10 years ago, people would simply walk away and close their doors, <laughs> leaving their clients high and dry. Uh, and also, leaving a bunch of money that they'd worked 20 years for to build up a business and then they walk away from it. So I'm glad to see that that's a trend. So I don't expect you to read all of this, but I'll highlight some of these. The, the nine pillars starts with, you have to have a profitable business model. And we all need to support people who have profitable business models. And at some point, I want clients to reject anybody who comes and wants to do business for them uh, who doesn't have a profitable business model. Because if you take, let's say you, you're an attorney and you got a, whatever, a $3 million business, you're gonna put that in the hands of somebody who may go out of business or has financial trouble. It just doesn't make sense. And so we need to always be making the conversation about things other than money. That attorney doesn't need to save $1,000 a year. The attorney needs to secure their data, secure their clients' information. And so backup is a huge piece of that. Um, and of course, monthly maintenance. Um, and the continuing education is massive. I think the ethics, which uh, there's a whole committee uh, forming to deal with ethics in the National Society of IT Service Providers. Um, we need to defend our client systems. We literally are the front lines against people on the dark web who are spending 
billions of dollars to attack these systems because they're getting billions of dollars in revenue. You know, even say five, six years ago, uh, a ransom when they first appeared, 100 bucks, 150 bucks, $1,000, sometimes 10,000. Now they are millions, which means that they are funded with the highest paid programmers in the world are doing AI for the bad guys. Um, <clears throat> so we have to figure out um, some of the, the effective responses to all of this, you know, the, the, and when I say our greatest challenges, that includes government regulation, that includes ransomware, that includes, uh, you know, working with the insurance industry to figure out how to keep rates rational and normal, um, and also secure our clients' data so that their interest, their insurance rates stay as low as possible. Um, and finally, we, you know, we have to have a way for newcomers in this industry to feel welcome and to, uh, you know, we've always welcomed people and given advice, but a lot of the advice is just so haphazard. There need to be acceptable standards where we say, go get training in this, go figure out how to do this. And, you know, I don't do very much technical training. Uh, my, my training is on the business side of running your business, but uh, there's amazing stuff with uh, Bigger Brains, uh, Chip Reeves organization, uh, and lots of people do education in this industry. Obviously, you know, CompTIA and, um, you know, other folks, Eric Simpson, there's lots of education out there and people need to take advantage of that. And imagine for all of the, you who have gray hair, imagine if you committed the first year of your business to figuring out how to run the business instead of the technology. And it literally goes back to Michael Gerber, right? And if you haven't read The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, do that, start today, download it. Um, you'll be done reading it by Monday and it will change your business. So we also have these uh, you know, interesting evolving uh, goals. Um, and in my mind, uh, one of the important things we need to do is work together as a community to move forward. Uh, the National Society of IT Service Providers is having an all member meeting um, and it is, uh, I think February 9th. And I encourage you to sign up for that and attend. Uh, we're gonna talk about moving the industry forward. And uh, I would love to have you be part of that. Uh, membership in that organization is only $100, which was set by the board to be low enough that no one can argue that they can't afford it. So click that link. Kara, put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, and then finally, let me just have you all take a breath while I take a sip of coffee. Here's what I see. Here's my little crystal ball. <laughs> uh, first, the easy stuff. I think mergers and acquisitions are going to continue. And, and I say to the detriment of good quality service. And I know there are people who get pissed off when I say this. Some of them, some of them argue with me on Facebook. That's okay. I have very tough skin. Plus, I'm really good at ignoring people. So, But I believe that the larger an organization gets, the more difficult it is for them to give good quality customer service. And one of the problems is, especially in our industry, people think of customer service as a thing that happens at the end of a relationship or near the end when you've sold somebody something, you've delivered the services, and now there's a problem and you got to deal with that difficult conversation. If that's your vision of customer service, every single thing in your company is probably broken. Customer service starts before you meet a client and you're putting out your branding and your impressions and you attract people who wanna do business your way. Customer service happens during the sales process. It happens during the onboarding process, during the first job when your people show up at somebody's office. It happens with the automated systems you use to communicate with people. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you are pissed off by chatbots that don't appear to understand your problem? And they say, oh, it, it looks like you're, you want warmer fries. Like, no, that's like, it's nothing to do with that. Customer service 
happens every day that you serve clients. It happens in your billing process. It happens in your collection process. It happens at every piece of that relationship. And if you do it right and you have customer service from that perspective, you have very few of those difficult conversations because you manage the relationship from the start with a focus on the client. And in mergers and acquisitions, customer service always gets reduced because the goal is on metrics that do not, with very few exceptions, improve customer service. The metrics improve performance, they improve the flow of money, they improve standardization, they improve mediocrity, they have companies move to the middle where the juicy goodness and all the money is flowing right now. And that means the extremes where excellence happens get snipped off. And then eventually those companies get big enough that they say, now we have to go have an entire department that's dedicated to customer service. Why is that? Because now customer service is bolted on at the end. And again, just my opinion, but um, that's my view of what's going on to a large extent with the mergers and acquisitions. And I will tell you, it's almost humorous to me. When I take on a coaching client that is has just either merged with somebody else or is one of these big companies that's gobbling up smaller companies, 100% of the time, they have all the problems of the smallest MSP. They don't have good processes. They don't have good procedures. They don't have documentation. They don't have a standard operating procedure for how a ticket is managed. They don't have control of their own service board. right? And that just gets worse during the M&A process. So, you know, it's funny because a lot of those people don't participate in a lot of the forums. They don't they look down their noses at, at shops that have 25 or fewer employees because they've made it big. Many of them are not even profitable, but yes, they've made it big. They love that top line revenue um, and someday they're gonna have profit. Um, so it's, it's humorous to me that they have all the challenges of small businesses, but they have the arrogance of saying, oh, but we're this big. So I may just have lost a lot of potential clients, but that's okay. There's a, there's a few more waiting to take their place. So I encourage you to be super aware that when you sell your company, you will lose control of customer service. You will lose control of everything. That's what it means to sell your company. So even if you stay on for a year, uh, you will have a great deal of heartbreak. And that's just, that is the way the world works. Um, Jameson West wrote a book on, you know, the, the emotional side of selling your business and it's, it's worth a read. So I think that the great resignation is gonna be over somewhere about the middle of the summer. Um, and that when people go back to school, um, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have whatever the new normal is for <laughs> uh, employment in the United States. Uh, I believe that the standards that we've seen are just gonna become stricter. Um, again, look to Mike Semmel, look to others for great education on CMMC and NIST and how you can um, change your business to be focused uh, specifically on that. That was the easy stuff. Uh, and maybe it's easy to say the legislation will, will continue as well. Um, but here's the biggie. I think what's emerging, the next evolution of our industry is a business model in which we all outsource to each other. And here's what I mean. We've already seen the emergence of security specialists, where you say, oh, I can, I can do so much, but uh, I, I, I can't handle security with the modern stuff. I, my company has three employees and we're too small and we can't keep up with it. But you can partner with somebody who can. And that, that somebody, more and more, is an organization that doesn't want to do day-to-day -day managed services. They don't want to do all the, all the stuff you do. <laughs> uh, and so that business model, I think, is going to be multiplied with people who have specialties in lots of stuff. Many of you also uh, outsource either the building of machines or the cabling of systems. You, maybe you outsource people who do uh, telephones, uh, security systems, signage, whatever. Um, I think we're going to see that grow and grow and grow. And uh, there will be, I, I can just see the, the, the next round of new 
organizations that show up on the showroom for, floor are people who have five years experience helping uh, IT service providers outsource to each other on the specialties of what they do. I don't know how people always man manage to show up day one with five years experience, but it happens. So that's my big prediction for 2022. Um, and I also think training opportunities are bigger than they've ever been. Uh, Amy Babinchek at uh, Harbor Computers has an entire uh, person dedicated to training, right? They've, she's developed a training arm to help her clients be educated about technology. I think that's massive. And I think that you have the opportunity to do that. Some of it for free or included in your plans, some of it uh, for pay. The training that I did, the cybersecurity training that I mentioned before, I got paid full price for that, and um, which is a few thousand dollars. Uh, and I and I think you can too. You know, you are giving something of tremendous value that's critical to your clients. And as the world gets more and more complicated, you can't know everything. You cannot understand all of the technology that's out there, and neither can your clients. And that's why relying on each other will help us as a community actually become stronger as we figure out, you know, who's the best at providing this outsource to an IT service provider or this outsource to a managed service provider, uh, and on it goes. I would offer up before we get to questions that uh, I am, I've been doing training myself at Great Little Seminar for about eight years, and uh, we have a whole series. We now have 20 five-week classes and again, the people of, in my community get those for free for everybody else. It's, it's still a great deal. Five hours of live training uh, with lots and lots of handouts uh, for $299. But starting this week, we are now IT Service Provider University, itspu.com. And in addition to the five-week courses, uh, we are adding certifications. So if you take a course, you go through all the quizzes, we've added quizzes to all 20 classes. And then uh, we are also adding uh, an exam, which is $199. Um, or if you're in the community, it's $99. Um, and then that makes you an IT service provider university certified professional. Um, and we have pathways for management technicians, office uh, admins, sales and marketing and the service manager. Um, and those pathways, if you take five exams in one of those pathways, you will be a, uh, a certified specialist in that. Um, and so I'm doing an intro webinar on January 25th. I would love to see you there. If you go to bit.ly slash ITSPU01, uh, you can sign up for that. Uh, I would appreciate it very much. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be putting this in my newsletter and other things. Um, my plan for you for 2022 is to start making sure that you build a training plan, not just for yourself, but also for your employees. I mentioned Bigger Brains. Bigger Brains allows you to have at in a ridiculously cheap price, um, lots of classes, hundreds of classes that are available to all of your clients um, for a flat fee. Um, it's a great, wonderful add-on, but you can also do this training yourself. Um, and work with every single client to know what you're going to do the day after uh, there's a cyber attack. You know, everybody's got a budget for backup the day after uh, an attack. Everybody's got a budget for, for, you know, fire suppression the day after the fire happens. Um, last year, I said, build a training program for 2021 and beyond. And now I'm telling you <laughs> to do it for 2022 and beyond. I think this is going to be a huge piece of your business going forward. And if it's not, it's a great opportunity to outsource to somebody who does that for a living, right? Um, so uh, again, find your outsourcers, identify them now, because my if, I, if I'm right, by the end of the year, the prices will have gone up for all the people who are really good at the things that people want to outsource. So begin today looking for the people that you want to partner with. Um, and you know, the next big cybersecurity attack, I, I was actually shocked that it didn't happen uh, over Christmas or New Year's, um, but maybe it'll be a, new, a Valentine's Day massacre. I don't know. Uh, it's coming. You know it's coming. I know it's coming. Um, 
but you know, just make this a year where you can focus on making everything in your business as good as possible. And with that, I will take any questions or in the case of Keith, snarky comments. Um, Josh says he hopes this is not the last thing that I want to do. It is, <laughs> it is. This is my life and I love it. So, uh, all right. Um, yes, Keith, I saw you in both cities. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, typo on NASDAQ, I don't know about that. Uh, so when you discuss standards, which is mutually exclusive certification or compliance, how do you feel education or training will be verified? Um, well, so, you know, it's true. The legislation leads towards academia, but that's only true to a point. I and mean, if you think about it, uh, many, many people decided that they were going to require either a uh, CompTIA certification or a Microsoft certification, again, about 15 years ago. So one of the things that's changed is that uh, we no longer require some of those things. And in fact, when I, when my business was at its peak, when I had, you know, like 12 people, uh, we made a big deal of saying we are a Microsoft shop. Every single person who works for us is Microsoft trained and Microsoft certified. And we made everybody do the 70-282 and we became small business specialists and we pushed that a lot. And it had legitimacy because we said it did, right? Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, you know, what constitutes legit has to do with how well it is received. Um, if you put out good, solid training um, and you, you do the right thing and it's, it's actually legit and, uh, you know, I think that it will be perceived that way. Um, I hope that answers that question. Uh, Sergey. It almost seems that switching to break fix will be a good idea. I have to be honest. Uh, break fix is probably going to have a little bit of a resurgence only because if you are entry level and you cannot possibly be, you're a one person shop and you can't be up to spec on security, it will be great for you to partner with somebody who is a security specialist. And I still think you need to sign contracts. You know, in my mind, you must have a contract if you are in business, um, but you don't have to have a flat fee and you don't have to have a managed service contract. Um, break fix allows people to pick up all that work. One of the things that's happening right now is IT is becoming far more expensive than it used to be. I always tell people, you know, it costs money to be in business. And people forget that, right? And they say, oh, I want my IT to be cheap. Well, you can't have your IT be cheap. I mean, you, you literally choose, you know, being ransomed by the Russians or spend money on security. Like pick one, you can't have both. Um, so, uh, but there are people who say, look, I can take care of all the computers. I cannot do the, the NIST quality uh, support. I can't go down the CMMC checklists. Um, that's cool. You should still be able to get into this business, have a job and have, remember I said, one of the pillars is having a pathway to the future for people. And maybe it is that by default, everybody gets into this industry as break fix. Yeah, that's just, if you're 18 or 20 and, and you've, you think you're a computer consultant, you've never heard of managed services, you will by default be break fix. Then you need to have a path where the rest of us are consistent in the answers on Reddit. We don't, we don't put up smart ass answers. We say, here's what you need to do. Go get a certification, go to CompTIA, uh, go to ITSPU, uh, you know, go get educated, figure out the business model, then figure out the programs and move forward. And if that is break fix, great. There's a bunch of people making a bunch of money with break fix even today. Um, and, and part of what we want to get away from, the reason I love the term IT service provider, even though I wrote managed services in a month, is that managed services has become this generic term for everybody in our industry. And that's not true. I would guess that the majority of people who call themselves MSPs do not provide managed services. And by that, I mean, they do not have a maintenance focused system. They don't do regular maintenance every month. 
They don't check backups on a regular basis and their client cannot rely on them when the stuff hits the fan. And to be honest, it's okay to be in this business and not offer those things. Just don't call yourself a managed service provider. To me, a managed service provider takes ownership of that client's system and manages it for them as if they were an in-house IT. And so if you're in that business, great. You should make the most of it and do everything you need to do to be successful. But if you're still in IT and you don't want to manage somebody's stuff, that's cool. Call yourself an IT service provider or a computer consultant or a value-added reseller or a solution provider and go provide those solutions. Uh, I think solution provider is another, just a great term. Uh, and I'm sorry we got away from it. Other questions or comments? Give me a chance to take a sip of my coffee. Well, thank you, Sergey, for being here. Anybody else? This is your opportunity. Well, it's almost top of the hour. So if there are no more questions, oh, one thing we surely see is more attacks on home users. Oh yeah, we'll see attacks on home users, basically <laughs> everything, everything will be attacked. Um, I hope you found this useful. Thank you, Ken. Um, we got three minutes till the top of the hour and some of you probably have uh, another Zoom call that starts in two and a half minutes. So uh, is there still value in pursuing certifications like Microsoft, VMware and Cisco? Absolutely. Uh, all of those things are great. The, the thing about technology-based certs is that they expire. And you know, uh, even the business side of things, you should probably do a refresh you know, every three years or something. But, um, you know, my first Microsoft certification was uh, Windows 3.1, not 3.11 for work groups, uh, right? And it was great for a while, but right now I don't know that I could find a copy of Windows 3.1 running on a machine in somebody's desktop. Um, so, you know, technical certs are awesome and spectacular and they separate you from your competition because most people aren't getting them. Um, but you also need the business side of things. You need to understand the, the model of um, running an IT service business. Uh, Elvis, the next big one, you wanna know when it is or what it is? <laughs> For me, the next big one is like the next big cyber attack. Um, I don't know when it'll happen. My guess is it that we're gonna see that continue to morph into new kinds of attacks that people were not expecting. The very, very scary thing is uh, that some of these attacks have been, the seeds have been planted 10 years ago. We're seeing more and more that old code is infected with basically a sleeper code that will be used at some point. And at some point it gets it gets on that list of approved code with no problems that's been around forever and it's okay to reuse and it goes into a library and then ka-chunk and we're just waiting for the day for it to get activated. We will see more and more of that kind of thing. Um, plus new stuff we can't imagine. Um, Josh says, uh, finding a way to express that every remote user for a business is a potential risk will be a key to securing 2022. Again, yeah, I think education is a piece of that and offering a specific program where you, you, you just assume they, they know that they're in danger and say, okay, we've got a, a home user security package, right? Uh, sold in a five pack. So if you only have six employees, you only have to buy two five packs. Uh, Dennis, the growth of the MSP is forecast at 10 to 20%. What do you see for the MSP focused on the SMB? Um, I would say it's probably just in line with that. You know, the, the, the folks who, who are in this business have a great opportunity for the next five years, which is if you are a small IT service provider, 
you can sell against the larger IT service providers who are no longer providing quality service. I, I think like you could build your entire career for the next five years on that premise if you chose to. The next big one, who is it? Who is going to be attacked? I have no idea. Or who is going to do the attacking? Well, again, I think your Russians are your first choice. Uh, uh, Alexander, how would you do, would you yourself define a business that is security focused to clients? Well, it depends. So uh, there are people whose, you know, their three tiered offering is three different tiers of security. And I think the best way to do that is to say, we only actually provide one tier of security. So the, the, the three tiers are how much is included versus how much you pay extra for, right? Do we include a small, medium, or large amount? Uh, and then you pay for the rest. Um, but you know, to, to go to clients, the problem is a client doesn't know how to buy because they don't understand your terminology, right? Every single person on this call will go to a client and say, we're security first, right? So you got to figure out how you message it so that um, you say, look, we give you what you want because the client doesn't care about the security. The client cares that they're in business every day and that everything just works and it's solid and reliable. And if anything goes wrong, you're going to put them back in business the next day and they're just going to keep going on without a hitch. So um, I wouldn't speak to them about security per se. I would just have it built in by default, but talk to them about reliability, about service, about helping them make their business as good as possible. If you haven't seen it, go to my blog at smallbizthoughts.com and just put in the term roadmap um, I've got lots of blog posts about the client roadmap process. And, um, you know, I have an entire questionnaire where we talk to clients about their business. Ask them, is it growing? Is it shrinking? You know, M Mr. Client, Miss Client, you know, what do you expect in 2022? Are you going to grow? Are you going to shrink? Is there new technology I need to be aware of? Are you moving your line of business to the cloud? Uh, are you bringing people home? You know, uh, taking them back to the office. What are you doing? have a lengthy ongoing discussion <clears throat> about their business and how you can make it better. Um, and you become part of their team. You know, this client that hired me to do cybersecurity training, I have been providing services with that company longer than any person currently employed in that company <laughs> has been there. The person at that company who's been there longer than anybody else came in about six months after I started providing IT services for them. So you can build a forever relationship, but that client is the one client that never skips having a client roadmap meeting. They always engage me in the discussion about their technology. And even though they're no longer my client for managed services, they still come to me. I, I house their website. I provide lots of services to them. Um, because they trust the fact that I understand their business. Uh, <clears throat> Thomas, is there any way to go on the offense instead of the defense? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, in some sense, the offense with regard to security is you literally know, it, you just assume you're going to be attacked and you know what you will do. Like, you know, I mean, if you think about it, someday something bad is going to happen to your car. It might be your fault, it might be somebody else's fault, um, but you need to know what you're gonna do, right? Uh, I, you can't say that you're going to have an earthquake, but you can have insurance. Um, you can't say you're gonna have a flood or a fire or a hurricane or a tornado or a snowstorm um, or a, a, you know, an airplane crashed into your building, but you can be ready. And you know, um, for me today, I would say the low fruit of preparation is backup and disaster recovery. You need a continuity program so that you tell the client, here's how you stay in business because you will be hit. Here's how you stay in business. You can buy this package and be back up in 60 seconds. You can buy this package and be up in an hour. You can buy this package and be up the next day. You can buy that package and we will we'll have you back up in a, in a week. Whatever you want. Um, you know, there are clients who could be down for a week and they're okay with that. There are other clients that 
the closer you can get it to a real, true, honest to goodness, one hour, the happier they're going to be. Um, but sell them that. If everybody, think about this, if everybody who's been attacked by cyberware, cyber, ransomware, had a backup and disaster recovery system where you could get them back in business the next day, there would be no more ransomware. Nobody would have millions of dollars to pay programmers to attack everybody on earth. It simply would not exist. So we literally know the answer. We've known the answer for 20 years. Many people on this call have sold imaging systems since the turn of the, the century. You know, the, the answer is literally well known and right in front of us. It's simply not deployed. Those backups, there's nothing more important, in my opinion, there's nothing more important in your business than testing backups. Because A, that means you have a, a backup system. And B, you know how to get that data back in a reasonable amount of time. And you don't push the wrong button and delete the backup, right? So that is the way to go on the offense is to say, we will put a backup and disaster recovery system at every single client's office. And if they can't afford it, that's cool. We just need to say, all right, I'm not providing those services because I don't want to be reliable. I don't want to be liable when you have a problem. Uh, I've got my partner over here who does security. You talk to them about that backup uh, or no backup, and I'll I'll just work on the computers. And you know, personally, I would walk away from that client. <sighs> so. There, there is no way to say that you won't have problems, right? Computers break, stuff happens. That's why we're in business. Uh, but you know, you can have an absolute plan that 100% guarantees that people will stay in business the next day. It costs money. Uh, Dennis, we choose to outsource telecom and infrastructure recently, even though we know it. It's much like web stuff. It's just not worth it for us. That's true, right? I mean, everybody here could be doing pulling cable, everybody here could be installing telephones, everybody here could be uh, installing uh, lighting systems and uh, physical security. Um, you got to choose what you're going to do. Extortion, Thomas, extortion, releasing stolen data for a small company. Again, that's one of those things where I don't know how you can do anything to prevent it. You know, that's, that's another, a new era that we got to figure out. Um, of how we encrypt data, a lot of this gets down to, you know, what's the weakest link, you know, and that's that's an age old question. I can't tell you how many times, if you take all the people on this call uh, and say, okay, how many times have you had a conversation about, no, you can't have that three letter password? Um, millions and millions of times. Um, and it's really no different than today where people say, well, I, Two-factor authentication is a pain in the neck. Well, okay, yeah, you know, it, it is, <laughs> right? Everything that slows down your productivity um, is a pain in the neck, but everything that provides security slows down, um, you know, productivity. So you just, you got to sell them that they got to spend the money to do what they can. I don't know that I have an answer for you on that one. Dennis is now focused on security backup and training. So there you go, in case you want to outsource to something, you know. All right, I think that's it for the questions. We're almost 10 minutes after. Thank you all for being here. I hope this was worthwhile. I will get that recording up and uh, with luck, we'll see you in a week at Killing It Live and in a couple of weeks at the uh, uh, NSITSP um, all member meeting. Thank you all for being here and I will see you next year at the next State of the Nation address.